Uh, good morning, colleagues. Um, welcome to the eighth meeting of the Devolution Further Powers Committee. Just remind everyone about the usual convention on mobile phones. Uh, Mark MacDonald will not be joining us today. Um, maybe a, a couple of weeks before Mark's back, I don't have any note. I've, I've heard, unfortunately, Mark had an accident and broke his leg. So, um, so we have Phil Kidd here as a substitute. He was indeed. Um, Sympathy all round the table. Now we've had that little bit of muttering, we'll move on to agenda item one. Um, the proposals to devolve further powers to Scotland and the scrutiny of the UK's government's draft legislation clauses. I welcome John Swinney, the Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary of Finance, Constitution and Economy to the meeting. Um, the Deputy First Minister has with him um, Sean Neill, who's the Acting Deputy Director, Finance and Fiscal Responsibility Division. Uh, Donald McGilvery, Deputy Director of Elections and Constitution, and Stephen Kerr, who's the Head of Social Security Policy and Delivery. Uh, and just for the, our witnesses' information, we have our three um, advisors with us today, Christine O'Neill, Heidi Poon, and Nicola McEwen, who are to your right. We've only got two hours, um, so as I said to my colleagues earlier, let's try to make our questions succinct. And Deputy First Minister, if you could do the same with your answers, that would be most helpful. I, I, I wonder, would you like to make a, an opening statement? Yeah, I'll make a brief opening statement, Convener. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to set out for the Committee the Scottish Government's response to the draft clauses published by the United Kingdom Government to devolve further powers to the Scottish Parliament. Following the publication of the draft clauses on the 22nd of January, I made a statement to Parliament on the 27th. I've also written to the Committee setting out the Scottish Government's views on a number of Smith-related issues. The Scottish Government does not believe that the Smith provisions go nearly far enough, but they are nevertheless an important step in providing the Parliament with further levers to improve the lives of the people of Scotland. The Scottish Government's objective now is to develop a bill that commands broad support and will be ready for introduction as soon as possible after the United Kingdom general election in May. There are a number of areas that the Scottish Government wish wishes to see improved. I have set these out previously, but the key areas include employability programmes, the power to create benefits, and the degree to which some of the clauses require consent from a United Kingdom Secretary of State. As well as draft legislation, the UK Government Command Paper sets out a discussion of various aspects of the proposed fiscal framework. This will be a key element of the package, and I met the Chancellor of the Exchequer on the 2nd of March to progress this aspect of the work. I was encouraged by the fact that the Command Paper recognised the need to proceed by negotiation and agreement in this area. My objective is that work on the legislation and the fiscal framework will proceed in parallel and that both will be ready before the Scottish Parliament is asked to pass a legislative consent motion in the spring of 2016. The reality of the dissolution at Westminster on the 30th of March means that time is now short to make progress on the draft clauses uh, with ministerial input. The Scottish Government has been pressing for progress in key areas such as the clauses and employability programmes, but to date we have no commitment from the United Kingdom Government that there will be any movement on these questions before the election, uh, but we continue to take forward those discussions. I am very happy to discuss these issues with Thank you. Thank you, dear First Minister. Um, just for your information, we had a quick discussion before you arrived on how we were going to deal with this question session. We will start off with welfare, move into tax and borrowing, Crown Estate and then constitutional intergovernmental relations. Normally I would have a, an opening question, but I want to get straight into the meet, so I want to go across to Stuart Maxwell, who will open up on this issue with issues about welfare. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, good morning, Deputy First Minister. I wanted to ask a, start with a general question about the idea of whether the uh, clauses, the draft clauses, reflect the spirit of the Smith Commission recommendations. Um, I mean, you'll be aware of a number of quotes from a number of organisations already. Who, I mean, for example, the SDUC said it's already clear that key areas such as welfare, the recommendations will not match the intentions of the Smith Commission proposals. We had Paul Spicker, Professor of Public Policy, uh, got Robert Gordon in front of us. Uh, recently, um, he's been quoted as saying, all falls some way short of even the rather restricted settlement in Smith. This is not what was promised. I just wondered what the Scottish Government's view um, of the clauses in general terms uh, in relation to what was re recommended by the Smith Commission is, and are there any particular areas where you agree that they, they don't match up to what was in Smith? I think it would be fair to say that uh, this is a, th th there's a, a different position in respect to this of some of the different clauses that uh, have been set out by the United Kingdom Government in the command paper. And some of the clauses, we think the um, 
come either very close to or fulfil what was expected under the Smith Commission. But there are a number where we do not believe that that is the case, and we've made those representations to the UK Government. I suppose to highlight the ones where we think um, there are um, the, the, the commitments have been fulfilled, um, we think that is the case in relation to um, elements of paragraph 49 of the Smith Commission report in relation to benefits for carers, disabled people and those who are ill, and um, benefits that currently comprise the regulated social fund, where we believe that the commitments have been uh, properly translated into draft legislation. Um, we also think that um, that is um, uh, the case in relation to paragraph 51 of the Smith Commission report, which looks at uh, allocating to the Parliament uh, the autonomy in determining the structure and the value of the benefits uh, that were uh, viewed in paragraph 49, to which I've just referred. Where we don't believe that the Smith Commission proposals have been properly translated into detailed legislation are in relation to um, clauses 20 and 21 of the Draft Scotland Bill on Universal Credit. Um, nor in relation to the power to create new benefits, which is clause 18 in the bill, um, nor in relation to paragraph um, 55 of the Smith Commission report, which um, essentially provided for uh, benefits or discretionary payments introduced by the Parliament, providing additional income for recipients. Um, and. Um, we also have issues about the employability programmes and the arrangements that are in place there. So that's a, that's a, a, I think, a fairly um, comprehensive summary of where we think the clauses have, the, the terms of the Smith Commission have been translated into the detail of the clauses and the areas where we need to have further dialogue to improve that. Th thank you. That was very helpful. Um, before I move on to the general powers to create new benefits, which you mentioned, I think, uh, draft clause 18, can I ask just a, for a quick response on the question or the argument that's been taking place about the, um, whether there is or there is not vetoes in place by the UK government over some of the, the, the areas uh, uh, which are supposed to be getting devolved? I guess the, the number of one of the points I made in my opening uh, statement, Kavina, which is about the degree to which the provisions in clauses um, 20 and 21, particularly, which require the agreement from the Secretary of State on changes made by Scottish ministers in relation to universal credit. And uh, you know, this, this is a, an area, I think, of, of particular uh, difficulty within the, uh, the command paper and the draft bill, because I can I, I, I don't think it's terribly difficult to foresee how um, the, what appear to be pretty innocuous um, requirements to consult the Secretary of State and secure his or her agreement mm -hmm. could be translated into essentially a, a blocking power because all sorts of excuses are used to stop something happening. And so I think our concern is that the way clauses 20 and 21 are drafted um, essentially convey that ability of a UK minister to stop the Scottish Government doing something. If they've got a reasonable explanation for why they are doing it, then that passes the test of the clause. And that, to me, therefore gives the UK Government the ability to veto a decision that, is, that the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament would wish to take. So I think that's, you know, that, that, that is, now the UK government would contend that the arrangements in clauses 20 and 21 are about administrative operation and efficiency and all the rest of it. But having just spent a couple of years of my life trying to make progress on the block grant adjustment and been, you know, stalled, delayed, more analysis, et cetera, et cetera. And before you know it, two years of your life has passed I'm very, uh, I think these clauses present a very serious impediment to the ability of the Scottish Parliament to exercise the powers that were envisaged by the Smith Commission. Now, I think this is, there's also another important point of principle involved in this, which is about um, 
the proper definition of devolution. Devolution, to me, involves passing over the power to the Scottish Parliament to do as the Scottish Parliament sees fit. Not to say, well, we'll, we'll pass over the power subject to us agreeing that this is all fine for it to proceed. That's not devolution. That retains control within the United Kingdom government in the form of a veto to say, actually, we don't approve of what's happening here and we'll find some way of stopping it happening. So in the interest of clarity, so that we have a, a clear and well understood devolved settlement and devolved arrangements, I think those clauses need to be revisited. Um, I, I'm assuming from that that you, you think there's at least the potential for um, any changes that any future Scottish Government or Scottish Parliament wish to, to make to get bogged down in some serious, you know, delaying um, discussions, shall we say, and that there are effectively, um, there's the possibility that uh, the will of the Scottish Parliament could be blocked by any future UK government? I think that's, I think that's entirely possible, yes. OK, can I move on to, um, convener, if you don't mind, the general power to create new benefits? My... Just tease that wee bit, wee bit more. Uh, in terms of the, the clauses we'd run, I, I heard what the Deputy First Minister said, but, the, but I think Deputy First Minister should also recognise that a UK government faced with a potential change which had significant technical or financial implications for it, and that would, uh, in terms of its IT or other such areas, there needs to be a mechanism still in place to allow that discussion to take place between the Scottish Government and the UK Government um, in any future settlement. Well, that, that, that could be, I accept that there is a need for proper administrative arrangements. And if I look at what's happening on the devolved taxes, for example, on land and buildings transaction tax, or well, I should call it stamp duty land tax, and um, it, that was being devolved, and, um, and the landfill tax, we've gone through you know, very clear administrative arrangements with the United Kingdom government, with various agencies of government involving HMRC and, and, uh, and Revenue Scotland. And we're now at the point where the agreement has been reached between the, the, both governments that all of the practical arrangements are in place so that the UK government can now proceed to switch off stamp duty land tax and landfill tax with effect from the 1st of April in Scotland. And I will be in a position to switch on land and buildings transaction tax and landfill tax. And all of those arrangements are now proceeding to operational implementation in a completely orderly fashion, as I indicated to Parliament would be the case. So it is entirely possible at an operational and administrative basis to do so. But crucially, I've taken a fundamentally different approach on land and buildings transaction tax to the original stamp duty land tax that was being devolved. Of course, the UK government has now um, mirrored the reforms that I've put in place, but we're taking a completely different approach on that tax. But I was free to do so and to take a different approach, but it's been able to be put in place in an orderly administrative fashion. And therefore, I think the administrative and operational arrangements are, can be perfectly taken forward um, uh, in dialogue with the, the UK government. But what this provides is a statutory ability for the UK government to stop us doing something in an area where I think we all believe, and all of us who were in the Smith Commission believed, should be the ability of the Scottish Government to exercise that, uh, that discretion. And was that done through the mechanism of the Joint Exchequer Committee? Or was it done through a different mechanism? It, but the, well, the, the, there's no, there, there wasn't really a, a, I suppose in principle, yes, convener, that uh, the Joint Exchequer Committee um, oversaw that, but there was then a, um, a, an intergovernmental an inter assurance board, I think is the proper right, terminology, okay. intergovernmental assurance board, which undertook on which we, my officials were, were, were full participants, and UK government officials were full participants, and through that, and actually, the the the, the point of reaching comfort that the arrangements could be switched off in the UK and switched on in Scotland was reached only because the Intergovernmental Assurance Board said we're confident in the arrangements that are now in place. That terminology, Intergovernmental Assurance Board, certainly it's new to me. It would be useful to get some information about that so that you know, this committee can see as much of that 
tra as transparently as possible. And we're very happy to share that with, with the committee. And, and that, that's a, it's, a, it's an intergovernmental um, mechanism which enables us to do the detailed work that's got to be done to make sure that things can be changed in, in this, in, 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 to affect the political choices made by ministers. Now, Stuart, were you going into a slightly different area? Or was uh, it? it's, the, it's the power to create new benefits. I want to go okay, well, I'll take a couple of supplementaries here to that area first. Just, just, thanks, Premier. It was just the, the general proposition because I, mean, I think we, we've come from one stage of devolution, I think, where the administration, say, of the health service was already being administered in Scotland and the devolution of the health service in Scotland was relatively easy. I think that was recognised in the Smith Commission that implicitly recognised the, the Smith Commission as we devolve further and get greater opportunities and risk through the further de devolution of shared, uh, where that, those responsibilities are shared, then it raises those challenges, doesn't it? And, and the, the, is there, was there not a complete expectation that there need to be new arrangements about how we share uh, the, the, the devolution of... Uh, of, of welfare, and was that not implicit in the Smith Agreement when he was, uh, you know, when the when the, the issue was highlighted about the, the better working arrangements with with, with uh, the governments? And so, I, I, why would it be a surprise? And why is is a, a reasonable uh, uh, request that that uh, that governments work more effectively together um, it, it described as a veto? Well, it's well, entirely possible to overcome that. It's entirely possible to reach an agreement, just as it is entirely possible to go into a negative situation. Both scenarios are possible. Well, I think the, I think the, I think the, the I, I, well, let me put on record at, at this point, Kavina, the commitment to the Scottish Government to work constructively in an intergovernmental fashion. I've just relayed to the committee how, on the devolution of the two taxes. Um, on land and buildings transaction tax and landfill tax, it's been a completely orderly process of doing that, with the exception of the block grant adjustment, which has been a bit fraught. But that's, that involves money, and most things that involve money are fraught. Um, so uh, that, 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 that's been done. So, and, I, and I commit myself in general, commit the government in general, to good intergovernmental working on these questions. And I think there's a, a, a lot of examples where that takes its place. The difference with... Um, Section 24 of the Scotland Bill is that it essentially provides <clears throat> a statutory backstop for a UK Secretary of State to stop something happening. And they can, as long as they can present that as reasonable, that is their entitlement to do so. And that's not, in my view, in the spirit of the type of intergovernmental working that Mr McNeill referred to convener in his question, which I think um, if there's an acknowledgement that there has to be joint working to cooperate to implement that, I wouldn't be making an issue about that. But what clause section 24 does is give a UK minister the ability to stop something that the Scottish Parliament may consider should happen in this area if they can present reasonable expectations. And that, and that, that to me is a veto. Are they refusing to move from that? Uh, have we you know, engaged with them and raised our strong view? Uh, as the ministerial meetings taking place, are they sticking to their position? Is it a hard position they're taking? Well, the, the, the discussions that um, we've had at both official and ministerial level um, do not yet have any movement involved on that question. And, uh, but we will continue to, uh, to pursue that um, as part of the uh, the work that we take forward in our discussions with the UK government. But that's yeah. one of the issues that we've raised with the UK government about the content of uh, the, the clauses. Still, still in supplementaries, um, Lewis and then Tavish. Thanks. On, on, on the same basis, Duncan McNeill talked about implicit in the Smith Commission. Actually, um, is it not explicit in the Smith Commission that the, the paragraphs which relate to universal credit say explicitly the Scottish Government will be given the administrative power to change the frequency of universal credit payments, and that is in the context of paragraph 43 of the Smith Commission. Universal credit will remain a reserve benefit administered and delivered by the DWP within this framework. The Scottish Parliament will have the powers outlined below. I mean, uh, 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 if that is the case, then the Smith Agreement says 
that universal credit will be devolved within a framework of overall reservation. So that requirement that it should be a shared benefit rather than wholly devolved as you would have wished um, is quite clear in the agreement. Well, I think, I think it comes down to a pretty simple concept. We're either able to do it or not. Are we able to do it? Well, are we able to do it? Well, we can only do it if we've got the agreement of the UK Secretary of State. Well, that to me is not devolving that administrative responsibility without a, a veto. But, but, but surely, surely the point of devolution from the outset in the very first act and also in the Smith Agreement is that it is not a simple uh, choice between wholly dev devolved and wholly reserved areas. There are a number of areas where, for example, executive powers are, are devolved and, and legislative powers are reserved. And, and, and the Smith Agreement seems to say that universal credit is reserved and that anything that's done is done within that context. That, but that, that assumes... Well, the, the Smith Agreement is quite clear that um, there should be uh, the ability to uh, vary these provisions according to the will and the wishes of the Scottish Parliament. And what Clause 24 says is that's subject to a decision by the United, a United Kingdom Secretary of State who can stop that happening. Now, that, to me, is not consistent with what the Smith Commission agreed to. It does, does, but do you not accept the point that the Smith Commission says explicitly universal credit will remain a reserve benefit? Well, you know, of course I accept that universal credit remains a reserve benefit, but if a power has been devolved to the Scottish Parliament, which we can't actually use because we've got to secure the agreement of a United Kingdom Secretary of State, then no power has been devolved, and we shouldn't, and we shouldn't try to, 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 to suggest to people that there is a power devolved if it's not actually been devolved. Mr. Mr. McDonald can't have it both ways. You know, on the one hand, he's trying to sustain an argument to me which says uh, that, that there is a power devolved. You know, tell me the Chamber has a power been devolved. And he's now sitting here saying to me, well, of course, you've got to accept that the UK government's got to be able to decide because it's a, a reserve benefit. Well, which one is it? Well, it's either I'm, devolved or it's reserved. I'm, I'm putting to you that whether you have signed up to something you like or not, that's what you signed up to. And it's perhaps you that's trying to have it both ways, because that, the Smith oh, no, Agreement oh, is no. clear. I'm, I'm, what, what I'm, I'm, not having, I'm not trying to have it both ways. I'm trying to make sure that, that the commitments that were given, that a, an ability to vary in terms of universal credit, were being allocated to the Scottish Parliament to enable the Scottish Parliament to take those decisions, are fulfilled. And what Mr Macdonald is now suggesting to me is it's acceptable for the United Kingdom government to constrain that, to veto it. I'm and that's not acceptable to the I'm Scottish I'm government. I'm not suggesting any conclusion. I'm simply trying to draw out your understanding <laughs> of the agreement to which you... Uh, which well, you I'm, well, well, uh, well, I'm absolutely crystal clear about what I signed up to. I signed up to the ability of the Scottish Parliament to be able to vary the terms of universal credit. That's yeah. what I signed up to. Yeah. And I'm now being asked to accept a clause which gives the UK government a veto over that. And I'm just simply saying to the committee, that's not consistent with what I signed up to in the Smith Commission. Okay, nor, do I, nor, nor, nor do I think... Nor do I think... I can't, well, I can't speak for others, but maybe, maybe some of them might start to speak in a moment. But uh, the, the, the way... The, 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 the view and the nature of the discussion, and I, I had the advantage over Mr Macdonald that I was in the room of the Smith Commission along with my uh, friends Linda Fabiani and Tavish Scott, um, that, these, um, that that was the, the intent of the Smith Commission. Tavish. It's not very blurred at this moment. Um, uh, uh, I wonder if I could risk a factual question. Um, Mr Swinney, you very fairly described the intergovernmental uh, discussion. Since the welfare clauses that Mr Maxwell's rightly introduced this morning have been published, how many ministerial meetings have there been and official meetings have there been to go through the issues that you've discussed? And how many are planned, do you think, before or are planned before PERDA so we get some feel for that engagement? There have been two formal meetings of a ministerial working group on welfare issues. Um, one was yesterday and one was a, a few weeks ago. Probably, uh, probably in the, I think it was during the recess in February. I was down in London for that. And there was one yesterday which I should have participated in, but I was involved in a, a chamber business mm. yesterday. So Mr Neil, um, Ms Cunningham and Mr Fitzpatrick, to, Mr Fitzpatrick represented my interest at that meeting yesterday. Um, and there was if my memory serves me right, at least one other 
preparatory meeting for that between Mr. Mundell and uh, Mr. Neil in advance of the two formal meetings. As to official meetings, um, I'd, I'd have to be helped out with how many of those have taken place. But there have been a number of discussions and video conferences to try to fancy these more planned before? I take your point about the UK general election, but are there more planned prior to per, uh, before uh, Perda well, kicks no, in no. London? I think the, what I would say, what I could commit to is certainly um, official discussion, because I think we all yeah. accept that yeah. you know, my, my, mines are going to, well, well, formally by the end of March, exactly. ministers will be yeah. uh, quite entitled to be uh, active on um, election matters, well, involved in election matters uh, full time. Um, and in advance of that, it will become more difficult to, uh, to engage at ministerial level. But the commitment has been reached. One of the points in my discussion with the Chancellor on the 2nd of March, which strays on to wider territory, but I think it's illustrative of the, 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 to help the answer reassure Mr Scott on this point, is that um, the, the Chancellor and I agreed with my recognition that he had an election to fight, and uh, I may have passing involvement in it as well, who knows, um, that our officials would take forward many of the substantive discussions on the fiscal framework to try to make sure that by the time ministers are able to re-engage after the UK election, as many of the issues are either wrestled with or identified and evidenced so that ministers can engage at a more advanced stage in the discussions so that we don't lose, short and blunt, bluntly, we don't lose sort of six to eight weeks yeah. uh, of this process. That yeah. is, is much official work to create a platform for decision making can be made for ministers. I'm grateful for that. I think it would probably be helpful to the committee if, if it was possible to give us some illustration of how many meetings had taken place at official level, not what was, goes on in those meetings, but how many Certainly had taken place. Yeah. To, and it might, it might be helpful actually to, to do that across the whole yes, range of be. different provisions because yeah. th that type of dialogue will have been happening on all subject areas. Okay, yeah. thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, Alex, did I see you so want to supplementary at this stage? Because I'll need to move on after you to back to Stuart. Cause it, it relates. Tamish has gone on to the area I wanted to deal with uh, just a couple of extra questions. First of all, has the Joint Ministerial Working Group proved uh, in any way an effective uh, mechanism for dealing with the type of dispute you're describing? I, 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 think, we're, I, think, it's, I think I'd be careful not to, to... I think we've got to be careful with our terminology here, mm -hmm. uh, because these are not disputes. These are us properly engaging to try to ensure that we get the best outcome in implementing the Smith Commission mm -hmm. proposals. So, you know, I, I, know, so, I, know, so I know a dispute when I see one, indeed. Uh, and, I, and I've been involved the, in a ha, few. Has, has the UK government proved to be open to discussion over these areas? Well, it's certainly open to discussion, yes, but we're not at a point, I can't report to the committee that we've got to a point of conclusion whereby we've got the UK government to change their minds. And I think in, in reality, you know, the UK government has put this, these clauses out in January and they are consulting about those clauses and they're involved, they're talking to us, they're also talking to mm. stakeholders in a, a wide variety of areas. And some of the points that Mr Maxwell made in his earlier questions highlighted some of the issues that stakeholders were raising about the clauses, some of, you know, some of which are similar to the points that I would argue. So we're in a period where the UK government is obviously considering these questions, we haven't got to conclusions of those discussions. Nothing has been closed down in that process. Um, and I would expect, I think in reality, given my answer to Tavish Scott a moment ago, that many of these questions probably will now not be resolved until ministers mm. are re-engaging after the Westminster election. Now, at the, West, at the welfare meeting yesterday, a number of points were discussed um, on different questions, and Mr Mundell agreed to consider those points whether we have a substantive response to that by the time the United Kingdom uh, Parliament is prorogued um, is a different matter. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, you know, I, what I would certainly say to Mr Johnson is that nothing has yet been closed down in the process. Yeah. Having asked that the UK government was open to uh, discussion on these matters, attempting to ask the next question, were you? But <laughs> I won't go, I won't go well. that far. But, but do you believe that... that is, is it an effective mechanism or does it need to be developed beyond its current uh, status in order to begin to deliver the, the decision-making processes that we need to make this work? Ultimately, my view is that these issues are only ever sorted out at political level between ministers. Mm -hmm. And 
fundamentally, you can have all the mechanisms that you want. You know, if I illustrate the block grant adjustment, we've had the Joint Exchequer Committee, Mr Crawford and I, when Mr Crawford was in government, started off the Joint Exchequer Committee to discuss the block grant adjustment. And we had all the processes and all the means of resolving it. And ultimately, with all the evidence work and research that was done by our officials, the resolution of that came down to a 15-minute conversation between the Chief Secretary of the Treasury and myself. So ultimately, these questions will be re resolved politically by ministers. So um, as long as there's a willingness to, 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 to do that. And what, what I'd like to put on the record to the committee is the approach of the Scottish Government is about simply trying to make sure that what we consider came out of the Smith Commission is turned into legislative reality. We are not trying, I, I, I can't remember if, I think it was maybe the Finance Committee I made this point to before, we are not going into this process trying to um, extend what was in the Smith Commission report or trying to get things into this process that were not agreed by the Smith Commission report. We are not trying to do that. We are simply trying to get into legislation what the, um, the Smith Commission uh, conceived should be in the agreement. Mm -hmm. now, just close with an observation that I think the, the, what the, the, the Cabinet Secretary has said, I agree with entirely. Uh, ministerial agreement is the, the secret of success in this area, but I find it hard to interpret how this committee monitors that and works alongside well, that's it. That's part of the job we've got to do. In our, uh, 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 next week we'll, be, we'll have a session on intergovernment relations mm. specifically, and that will allow us to get under that skin a bit. Stuart. Yes, thank you, uh, Convener. Um, I want to take us back to um, Draft Clause 18, if I may. Um, uh, we've had some, uh, well, a reasonable amount of evidence on the issue uh, or the question of uh, the ability or the power of the Scottish Parliament to create new benefits. Um, now, my understanding is that the, the effect of the Smith Commission said that new benefits in areas of devolved responsibility would be was what was agreed. Um, but there now seems to be in the um, draft clause 18 that it's about new benefits uh, or it's, it's restricted to those areas that are uh, being discussed to be devolved. It's not new benefits across all areas of devolved responsibility. Just, just for the record, though, could, Deputy First Minister, could you uh, express the view of the Scottish Government whether or not you agree with uh, the, the, the clause or whether you agree with the um, some of the evidence we received as to whether or not the clause actually meets what was laid out and published by the Smith Commission? Um, I, I don't think the clause meets what was set out by the Smith Commission because within the Smith Commission there was a quite explicit uh, discussion about whether on this very point of distinction mm -hmm. whether this was about um, extending creating the ability to establish new benefits in the areas that were being devolved or in areas of devolved responsibility. And my very clear recollection was that the agreement was around the creation of new benefits in areas of devolved responsibility. And um, that, to me, should shape the clause. And that's not the case in relation to Clause 18. I'm just wondering, um, from, thank you for that, but I'm just wondering whether or not um, you believe that the, the clauses as published can be amended in some way, or, or is, there a, is there a serious issue here which means that they would have to be completely redrafted? I mean, is, is there any scope for change within the draft clauses at the moment? There's, I'm quite sure there's a, there's a, well, I, the clauses might have to be entirely redrafted, but, you know, that's not, I don't think we should consider that to be a, 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 a kind of gargantuan task. Mm -hmm. um, there may be ways of <coughs> revising the wording that's here to, uh, to fulfil the, 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 um, the commitment that I believe was uh, the agreement that was reached in the Smith Commission, or it may be that we've got to draft other wording, but I don't think we should view that as something that's uh, uh, you know, okay. a, 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 an unbearable amount. And of course, to go back to my earlier point, in this period, where um, ministers from the UK government are, are, are not as closely engaged in the process because of election issues, um, this would be a good opportunity to actually do the drafting so that when UK ministers come into office after the, um, uh, the, the, the UK election, 
we can come to an agreement on that point. And I would very, you know, and obviously there's, there's drafting capacity within the Scottish Government where we'd be only too happy to work collaboratively on producing such, um, such an approach. Okay. Can I ask if it's the, the Scottish Government's view that the, uh, the draft clauses um, could be implemented or incorporated um, without removing the general reservation on the assistance for social security purposes, which is in Schedule 5 of the Scotland Act 1998. Is it possible to incorporate the draft clauses without removing that general reservation? Well, I, th I think I, I'd have to say that I think it would be... Um, I think to be realistic about it, I think it'd be inconceivable the United Kingdom government will remove the reservation in Schedule 5. Mm. So I think to be practical about it, I just think... You know, in terms of thinking about lines of argument, I might try to advance. I feel that's one that wouldn't get me very far um, in, 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 in any uh, context of the, of, of, of the UK government. So I think what we have to do is we have to make sure that sufficient um, space and scope is carved out to ensure that the clauses, that the, the policy position that was envisaged by the Smith Commission can actually be delivered within the context of a reservation of social security functions in Schedule 5. Just one final question, you know, if I may, in this area. Uh, my, my concern is, and I'm just, again, I'm asking for the Deputy First Minister's view on this, is if this is not, if this is not resolved, if this disagreement about Clause 18 is not resolved as to whether it was effectively um, devolved, areas of devolved responsibility or uh, new benefits in areas of the bits that are about to be devolved, um, it, is it not the case that effectively the, the Scotland Act, uh, 1998 Scotland, will effectively govern what the position is? So therefore, all of those areas that are currently re reserved and the current position as it exists will in fact be the de facto position. And we will be therefore, what was in the Smith Commission about areas of devolved responsibility will not happen. Uh, th that would, be, <coughs> of, of course, the, 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 you know, the reservation on social security provisions and, and members should be fully aware of the limitations and the difficulties caused by that reservation on Social Security. It's uh, an issue that has um, certainly, on, I can think of one particular issue which has um, stretched us significantly in trying to resolve uh, policy questions, uh, particularly on, council ta on the council tax reduction scheme, where the Social Security reservation was a very significant impediment to the Scottish Government being able to uh, work with our local authority partners on making good the reduction in council tax, or the, or the reduction that was applied in council tax benefit by the UK government. And we had to, you know, the social security reservation was a major impediment in how we resolved that. Uh, we were able to do so, but it was a major impediment. And we shouldn't underestimate the significance that that reservation applies to the handling of. Uh, of what would be legitimate aspirations on the part of a Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament to act in this particular area um, where it was limited by that reservation. Okay. Which you. is why, in my previous answer to, to Mr Maxwell, um, I made the point that it is vital that sufficient scope is carved out of that reservation to enable what the Smith Commission yeah. envisaged of the ability to create new benefits in areas of devolved responsibility is actually able to be fulfilled. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kabila. Bill. I think following on here, um, thank you very much, uh, Deputy First Minister. <clears throat> when new benefits or discretionary payments would be introduced by the Scottish Parliament, we'd obviously not be wanting to be robbing Peter to pay Paul and, um, and therefore um, seeing the uh, DWP claw back uh, through deductions and other benefits and payments which already exist in the UK, um, would we and how would we be sure that explicit provision was provided in legislation guaranteeing that these new benefits could be delivered without this fear of, um, of reduction and clawback? Um, the issue, well, the problem here is that um, the command paper indicates that um, instead of there being a legislative provision within the Scotland Act um, to enable individuals to gain the benefit of any new benefit provision without any loss of, uh, of existing benefit provision, 
um, is not put into any legislative form and the UK government say they will consider that on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, again, I think that does not, you know, again, Smith was absolutely crystal clear. If a new benefit is being created, then um, it should not be used as a device to reduce any other existing benefit that's provided by the UK government. So, um, I think the, 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 the legislative provision that could be put in place is something that would be, you know, perhaps a, a, a Scottish um, welfare provision disregard within the, um, the, the, the bill, and that would make it explicit and a guarantee on, um, on all circumstances where the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament decided to act in this area, then the individual was protected from loss of benefits um, as a consequence. Yeah. And, and thank you. And Paul Spicker, um, in evidence to the committee previously, <coughs> um, amongst others, has con expressed concern um, that uh, there could be a dilution of existing devolved competence in the sphere. Um, the clauses um, may exempt provision for discretionary payments to people who have been subject to a benefit sanction. And unless uh, that need um, uh, was, was addressed, then... Uh, then in the immediate as well as the short term, then uh, such as the Scottish Welfare Fund, which also exists in exceptional circumstances, would be superseded um, by, by um, the UK's uh, government's, devol uh, the UK government's um, benefits system. Uh, it's the fact that we already have the Scottish Welfare Fund, which works um, successfully, could be undermined uh, in this new system? Uh, is there any provision to cover to ensure that um, new uh, benefits which are being introduced will not actually find themselves in a similar circumstance? I think, the, I think what's um, important here is that we translate the principle of what the Smith Commission was proposing into legislative reality. Right. So therefore, I think what we, we need to do and what Smith envisaged was that uh, you know, individuals should gain the benefit of any additional benefits the Sc a Scottish Parliament put in place. And that's what we should legislate for. So there should be an absolute protection for those, um, for those um, new benefits and, and for them to have no consequential loss mm -hmm. at an individual level. And that should be legislated for. I, I, I think it would be fair to say that under the Scottish Welfare Fund, Currently, I think the legislative protection is in place to protect Scottish Welfare Fund payments from any such netting off, if we call it that, okay. by um, actions by the, U by the UK government. And therefore, we should simply ensure, to, to, to guarantee that the Smith provisions are turned into legislative reality, that the same provisions are put in place for the benefit of any new benefits that would be envisaged and applied by the Scottish Parliament. OK, well, that's very reasonable. Thank you very much. Linda, did I catch it right? You wanted to... And a supplementary to this, it, it was, was just to, you know, make it clear that it's not just about new benefits, but it's about top-up benefits as well uh, of existing ones, etc. And if we're talking about a Scottish disregard, um, I, I do have some concerns, first of all, about whether the systems that are in place for the UK government changing over to universal credit, personal independent payments and stuff, and we'd be able to cope with that. Do we, you know, have there been discussions around that? But also the other issue of some of the things that have come in through the draft clauses, I would mention as an example, direct housing payments, uh, would seem to me not to reflect the spirit of... Um, what was discussed during the Smith talks um, and the ability to make any changes. So where there is, what I'm trying to get to is that whole picture. Um, if there are some benefits that we're only talking about having the administration benefit for, rather than being able to make changes and top up, if there are issues around um, even at, at this late stage, talking about the potential of a Scottish disregard, how far down the road are we of actually trying to achieve what was applauded in the Smith Agreement by so many people and, in fact, has been put out there as something that is already happening? Well, we're, at, we're, we're at a fairly critical time in that process. 
because um, when the United Kingdom Parliament reconvenes, uh, this bill will, will, will need to start to make pretty early progress, very early progress actually, if it's to be, if it's to complete its parliamentary processes in Westminster and attract a legislative consent motion in this parliament before the Scottish Parliament rises for the 2016 mm -hmm. uh, parliamentary election. So the, 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 this is a very critical period and my view is that the, the space to influence this process is between now and the bill being introduced in the House of Commons after the UK election. Thereafter, I think it will be much more difficult to uh, amend the process and to amend the substance of it. Uh, and, and, uh, and also, I, I, I take at face value the fact that the UK government say they are consulting about these, these provisions. Um, and um, I hope that means that they are open to the issues that are being raised. I think the advantage of this very detailed scrutiny that the committee is undertaking, the dialogue that is being facilitated by the committee, is that it's able to reach a range of individuals who were participants in the process. And I don't just talk about Ms. Fabiani, Mr. Scott, myself, and, and, and our colleagues who were on the Smith Commission, but those who made representations to the Smith Commission and who have engaged with the UK government subsequent to that on many of these questions, who would share many of the points that I'm expressing here today. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that that is all considered and consumed by the UK government, that's listened to by the UK government, and that uh, changes to the clauses are brought forward uh, in advance of the introduction of the bill in the UK Parliament after the election. No, we've, right, got to, okay. we've got to a situation where if we don't get into taxation and borrowing, we'll, we'll not be able to, so, so I apologise, but so I'm sorry to cut that, cut that short so quickly. Um, we need to make our questions a bit sharper, perhaps our answers a bit sharper as well. So let me try to show an example. What discussions have you had with the UK government around the fiscal framework and what progress has been made? Uh, I um, met the Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, on the 2nd of March for a discussion around how we would take forward the fiscal framework. We acknowledged that um, the, uh, the, the timing of the election was going to interrupt ministerial engagement on this question. So we agreed that at, uh, a process would be led by senior Treasury and senior Scottish Government officials to take forward the detailed work that will have to be undertaken on the fiscal framework. Um, to enable ministerial engagement and discussion after the election. Um, that was agreed on the 2nd of uh, March and there has already been discussion between Scottish Government and Treasury officials on this question and there are various further discussions to take place on, that, on, on those issues. Now, we had a discussion about Purda earlier and the impact on discussions between ministers. I understand that, but I'm assuming, and I think I'm probably right in assuming that that despite there won't be any ministerial contact, all through the period of the general election, there will still be opportunities for officials to develop further the whole process. I, I should have made that explicit, uh, Kavira. That, that, that was the very point the Chancellor and I agreed, that um, we wanted to make sure that as much of the groundwork that could be undertaken on the fiscal framework was undertaken by officials to marshal the evidence, trying to get to a sense of how we could resolve some of these questions, uh, what arrangements could be put in place, so that when ministers are able to interact on this uh, after the UK election, the discussions are not where they are today, but the evidence and the detail will have been gathered together, as much ground that can be closed off is closed off by the time ministers engage after the UK election. Yeah, that's quite helpful because obviously that, that means there's no inertia in the system really, and None. things are still None. going on None. and therefore there's still the opportunity for those who want to, to influence outcomes. Um, as far as the, this com committee is concerned, and indeed the, the wider parliament, however, um, the transparency of what that fiscal um, framework will look like will be hugely important to us. Uh, and therefore, what assurances can you give us that we'll be played in as much as possible, ourselves, the Finance Committee, others, the parliament in general, about how that's developing? Because obviously there will then come the crucial issue of whether or not that agreement can be 
found and arrived at before we come to an LCM next February? And what's your view on that? I think this is quite difficult territory, to be honest, Convener, because... Um, well, I'm asking it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that helpful remark. <laughs> um, it's always nice to be encouraged. <laughs> um, the, the, if, if I look back at the, the block grant adjustment discussions, I essentially, what I said to Parliament for the best part of two years is that discussions are ongoing on this question, because I didn't feel that I could say, well... They've said this and I've said that, and they've said this and I've said that. I just don't. I, I just think that removes the scope for, well, bluntly, for ministers to come to some form of compromise. If we've got to come to, we'd, ultimately, the block grant adjustment was a compromise between the chief secretary and myself between two different numbers: 524 million and 461 million, and we settled halfway at 494 million. Now, you know. <laughs> in, a, in, in a very well evidenced fashion, Mr. Scott, and after detailed consideration, as you would expect, but it was halfway in the middle. Um, so, and that involved compromise on both of our parts, and I acknowledge that, and Chief Secretary would acknowledge that and from his perspective as well. And, and I think, whilst I, w I wish to be as open as I possibly can be with Parliament, I, I think there has to be some. De I have to honestly tell Parliament of the difficulty that, that of, of being as, as open about all of the, the, the steps in the process will be, because that may restrict the, the room for compromise. Do you accept that this committee, Parliament, the Finance Committee as well, we need to be absolutely clear about what the agreement was before any LCM was passed? Yes, and it, 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 well, there has to be a fiscal framework in place which is acceptable to Parliament before any LCM can pass. I, I don't think it's in any way possible or plausible for an LCM to be passed without an agreed fiscal framework being in place that is to the satisfaction of, uh, of Parliament. Duncan? Just, just in the context of that, and I've seen the civil servants with you, you're a bit crestfallen when, when you... You dismiss the efforts almost. And all we need in these things is a 15-minute meeting and anything else that went before it. I've seen the, 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 your officials with you, dis, you know, just diminish slightly at that point. <laughs> it would certainly slim down the civil service, Mr. McNeil. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're, you're making an important point, but you know, the, the, for the understanding and the transparency, it is important, I think, that we know the terms of reference of the engagement, at least. We know... The, the, the type of issues that are coming up. We, we know the rules of engagement about how uh, the facts and figures and the analysis is agreed, what's neutral and what's not. So we can make a judgment about the statements that a UK government would be making or indeed a Scottish government would be making in public because there have been public statements about the difficulties, um, whereas we never saw that. Uh, in your own experience uh, with local government, when you had to concord that, there were, there were closed meetings and everybody accepted that, and any difficulties were resolved in private uh, and access to the appropriate people. We, we, we just want to be sure that the terms of reference and what we can get uh, as committees of the Parliament in that process and the real understanding of what's the negotiation that's taking place, there must be a level of information that would be available to the committees and subsequently to the people who you know outside. Hmm. I, I, I don't in any way want to appear as if I trivialise the, 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 this issue by the 15-minute remark. I, that, 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 what that's about is, is saying the final point of agreement ultimately is that point. I but I think Mr McNeil makes an absolutely fair point about understanding what are, what are the issues involved? What are the, what are the topics being considered? Borrowing, um, application of no detriment, uh, administrative arrangements, cost uh, arrangements, all of these questions will be material to a fiscal framework. Um, to understanding the... I don't see any issues about um, the, uh, that all being shared with committees. There will obviously be an evidence base that is being gathered and subject to dialogue with the United Kingdom government. I think we should be as open as possible about what is the evidence base part of the exercise that civil servants, just to reassure them that they have got things to do over the, uh, in, in the same period. Part of what civil servants have to do 
is to try to work their way through all of the possible evidence that could be considered around resolving just one question within the fiscal framework, of which there will be many, many questions to be resolved, to marshal that evidence, to um, test that evidence, and to get it to a point where they can extract from that evidence the issues that ministers need to resolve. So ministers can then, after the processes, the, the elections out of the way, can consider the evidence and then see out of that evidence what are the issues that need to be resolved. And I think in, we, we should be open to considering how much of that evidence can be shared with uh, parliamentary committees to ensure that parliamentary committees have the confidence. You know, although there was a 15-minute discussion around the block grant adjustment, there was a lot of detailed work that went into evidencing both questions and ultimately, you know, both um, propositions that we resolved, but ultimately we had to resolve it somewhere and we resolved it in the middle. But there was plenty of evidence that supported um, five to six million as a block grant adjustment and plenty of evidence that supported four, six, one million as a block grant adjustment. And, you know, we came to a political agreement about what was reasonable within that. So I think subject to um, reaching an agreed position with the United Kingdom government about how comfortable they are about information sharing with committees, uh, I would be uh, very keen to be as open as possible about this process because I acknowledge the importance of Parliament being satisfied that there is a robust fiscal framework in place. Yeah. Alex? Yes. No, I'll try and brush through this uh, to try and please the convener. The, the first thing I wanted to ask about in terms of taxation uh, is that we've seen what's been described as gaming around uh, issues of tax and the example of what happened with stamp duty uh, is an example of that. When it comes to the Scottish rate of income tax, what's your view on how accountability and transparency can be achieved to avoid that continuous gaming going on in future? I think the, the, these are, this is quite a general issue because it affects the, the parliamentary processes of this institution versus the parliamentary processes of the Westminster Institution, uh, the Westminster Parliament. Uh, obviously, we have a we have a very different budget process in this Parliament compared to the mm -hmm. UK. Um, you know, I, I, we are. I am required to set out by agreement with the Finance Committee a budget by the 20th of September, a draft budget by the 20th of September, to consult on that for um, uh, ideally about um, an eight-week period, um, maybe even a 12-week period. Um, um, and then to come to Parliament to legislate for it over a succession of three weeks. The Chancellor can stand up at 12 o'clock and announce something and it takes effect at midnight mm -hmm. uh, or even earlier. So we're operating in two very, very different spheres of parliamentary accountability. And um, I think, obviously, I, I, I've worked uh, consistently within the parliamentary framework that's been put in place here. and I. I I have no desire to change it, but I do think we have to acknowledge the risk that there is the potential for um, that gaming to take place as a consequence mm -hmm. of, of the, the different parliamentary arrangements we have in place. Mm -hmm. The specific instance where uh, you will acquire through this process the right to define rates and thresholds, but you won't have the power to define the tax base. Uh, which could change quite radically. So how would a, a future government build then contingency uh, into the budgetary function to buffer against variations like that that might strike you uh, unexpectedly? Well, this, this is where this gets into some of the substance around the, the fiscal framework and the interpretation of the, uh, the term no detriment. Because... I can quite conceive, I can quite easily see how there could be detriment to the Scottish tax base of a decision taken by the Chancellor to affect, for example, issues beyond my control on income tax, but which would have an effect on income tax take uh, in Scotland. And there will be an issue of detriment that comes out of that as a consequence of those actions. So the fiscal framework is very material to determining uh, all of these points. Now, there will be some, so that, that's on the, the question of no detriment. There will be a couple of other things that we have to think about in terms of our protection. Um, one is about a, the establishment of a cash reserve to deal with the, the fact that a, a very much more significant part of our budget will now be dependent on a revenue stream which will require 
prediction. So there will be volatility around that. We have to establish a cash reserve to do that. Um, and then secondly, um, th there has to be the acknowledgement that revenue borrowing will be required um, or may be required to provide us with the capacity to deal with any fluctuations that take place and affect us in a significant fashion. Um, and those, uh, uh, and we, we need to make, uh, and they're material to the agreements around the fiscal framework. The changes that are proposed uh, for income tax, of course, come on top of a set of changes that we've, yeah. we've agreed but have still to be implemented. Uh, and we've spoken to accountants that are at an advanced stage uh, of preparing for the, the next set of changes, but see this uh, subsequent set of changes as being something which they will have to build on top of that. What kind of time scale do you see for the implementation of the changes that are being proposed? What can be achieved and what needs to be achieved? I, th I think I, I'm working on the assumption that we will be able to uh, reach agreement on all questions for the Scotland Bill to be passed by um, the spring of 2016. Mm. Um, and of course, in April 2016, the Scottish rate of income tax under the Calman proposals mm -hmm. will begin to take effect. Now, some of the um, now obviously the Calman proposals envisage um, a two to three year period of transition or assurance around the, uh, the, the, the sums that will be raised from the Scottish rate of income tax. Um, so we're obviously in a transition period around that for at least a two to three year period. I think one of the questions that I will want to explore, and I, I can't give Mr Johnson a definitive idea today about when I could see the full tax powers implemented, my preference would be to move as quickly as we could towards the full p uh, provisions envisaged by Smith um, rather than having a prolonged period of um, the Calman implementation. But we would have to test out the detail of all of that to determine how readily that could be translated into practical reality, because obviously that is dependent on interaction with HMRC um, as they will be collecting the Scottish rate of income tax under both the Calman and the Smith uh, scenarios. Mm -hmm. I had intended to go and talk about borrowing, but was there other tax issues? No, I'll let, I'll let um, Tawish in first on supplementary. Thank you. Can I just ask one supplementary, Deputy First Minister? You mentioned the cash reserve to Mr Johnson there. Um, is that a, did, if I caught you correctly, is that a new financial, as it were, line that you think ne either needs to be in place now or will be in place in your accounts because of the changes that are envisaged uh, as a result of the transfer of powers? Well, the, cash, the cash reserve provision comes in as a consequence of Calman, uh, and that's a, you know, a, a, under the current pre Calman arrangements, uh, I'm unable to carry a reserve. The only mm -hmm. reserve function I really have is the ability yeah. to use the budget yeah. exchange mechanism to carry forward a, you know, around about £190 million pounds of expenditure from one year to another. Mm -hmm. But I have no, I am prevented from having a long-standing reserve. The Calman proposals change that to enable us to put into that cash reserve um, resources that um, we could utilise to protect for volatility mm. on some of the tax mm. uh, changes that are now being implemented. So that, that, that's, a, that's a Calman arrangement. Mm. I think the issue which becomes more apposite out of the Smith Commission yeah is the access to revenue borrowing because the, the, the cash reserve, um, once the resources, I'll stand to be corrected on this point, but once the resources are put into the cash reserve, they can only be used for mitigating volatility. So I couldn't put it into the cash reserve to mitigate volatility and then, for example, spend it on, on new, ro new roads yeah. in Shetland or yeah. something like that. Very well <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just thought I'd clarify that for yeah. avoidance of doubt. But the, um, so, it's, um, the, the, so it has to go in for that purpose and that purpose alone and okay. be accessed for that purpose alone. So, yeah. But obviously, as we move into the Smith provisions, the degree of... Um, um, the parameters for potential volatility are much greater. greater yeah. So therefore, it's, what is envisaged is the cash reserve and uh, revenue borrowing to provide us with okay. a greater degree of 
um, flexibility in financial management. And, and that's fair, and forgive me my lack of knowledge in this, uh, have you already set out a statement of policy in this area, or is this something that you will to the Finance Committee in the course of next year's budget, or at, at a certain point set out a position of, as it were, policy on wh what you envisage that cash reserve being in the context of the Smith um, transfer of powers? I, I've not set out um, any particular details on no. okay. amounts of money that I would allocate into that, but yeah. I think, you know, if I was to for example, if I, if I was to find a situation where on the application of the first year of the, the smaller taxes, as they're yeah. called, um, um, and there was a, a surplus beyond what I thought would be raised, yeah. um, then I would put that into the cash reserve. Um, and that, that's the kind of model that's one of the policy approaches that I would consider taking. Um, I'm obviously free, if I so choose, to allocate other resources to go in there if, if I thought that was important. But obviously, that you know, I have to be careful about that in relation to the locking away of resources that I cannot use for another purpose. Okay. Um, but, the, the, but the arrangements around the cash reserve are, um, are sensible arrangements because we need to have that ability to protect against... Uh, against volatility. Yeah, thank you. Now, now, Alex, before I come back to you on borrowing, I think Lewis had an issue about no detriment, which probably plays into this bit of the discussion. So, Yes, yeah, simply following up the point you made about the legislative consent motion must be clear about the fiscal framework, and, and, and you've described the process of reaching agreement on the block grant adjustment. In terms of what the Smith Commission says about no detriment post-evolution, in other words, the procedures for ensuring that neither government uh, disadvantages the other post-implementation. Uh, how far do you envisage uh, detail of, of, of how that would work being uh, included in an LCM next year, uh, this year? Uh, in other words, how far do you see it as, as something that needs to be pinned down in detail uh, I, in advance of... I think that has to be crystal clear. Mm -hmm. the, so, so, so in, and, and, uh, and how do you envisage it, clearly without uh, asking for your negotiating position <laughs> in advance, what, 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 what broadly are the terms in which you would seek, seek to reach agreement um, over the next few months? I think it's a, I, I think this is quite difficult, but I don't think it's quite difficult. I think this is very difficult territory, to be honest. And I think there's a, I think the no detriment principle at the point of um, devolution is probably reasonably um, clear about what that envisages. I think the second, secondary issues are much, much harder to, to, to grapple with. And I think we need to use the period that we have over the next few weeks to do some very detailed work on what that uh, might involve and how that could be taken forward before coming to any conclusions. Do you think, without, again, prejudging where, where that stands, do you think that might require further legislation to follow? Or is it something that would be best incorporated in the act that comes for the bill that comes I think it, I think it is absolutely critical that this issue is nailed down beyond per adventure in the, in the fiscal framework. Very helpful, thank you. Alec, back to borrowing. Yes, uh, on the subject of borrowing, uh, are you confident that the spirit of the Smith Commission uh, will be delivered and that will give you powers to borrow more than the 2.2 billion limit provided by the 2012 Act? Um, again, we, we, we're in negotiation territory here. Um, I think what's in, what's, in, uh, what's in my mind on borrowing is that um, we need to have what I, think, well, what I think was in the Smith Commission report and what I think we'll have to put into practical reality is there has to be an acknowledgement of the importance of the revenue borrowing point mm -hmm. that I was discussing a moment ago to deal with the, the, the volatility yep. in revenues. Um, I think there has to be um, a, a, a greater flexibility and facility for us to undertake uh, capital borrowing, um, borrowing for capital investment purposes. Um, and the fiscal framework has to determine how that should be um, put in place and how it should be deployed. Um, and I think all of that 
has got to be in addition to uh, the um, acceptance in principle that there is a continuing role for uh, for CDEL, for capital DEL, within the Scottish Government budget. So uh, I think there's been, I've picked up some sense that um, borrowing for capital purposes might remove the CDEL provisions mm -hmm. of the Scottish Government. And I would want to be absolutely crystal clear with the committee that that is not my interpretation of Smith, that I think Smith envisages us uh, having ongoing CDL capability and the ability to use capital borrowing to enhance, to add to our CDL provision and the revenue borrowing is quite a different proposition altogether. Yeah. In terms of revenue borrowing, uh, of course you rightly match that uh, uh, responsibility for covering tax revenue volatility. Uh, what level of borrowing do you interpret as being necessary to cover the level of tax uh, that has been devolved under the Smith process? That's, we're, at a, we're at an early stage in, in trying to determine that. And obviously, I think, I'll, uh, despite what I said in my earlier answer to Mr Johnson about the transition period on the, Kalman, the implementation of the Kalman proposals and the Scottish rate of income tax, that transitional period will give us more detailed information about the Scottish income tax base and the performance of the Scottish income tax base, which will give us better detail about what our likely borrowing, revenue borrowing requirement might be in the years to come. Because the data on Scottish income tax collection, uh, performance and collection, will, we will need to see more of that before we could come to a definitive conclusion on revenue borrowing. And uh, I think we'll see that emerging over the course of the next couple of years. Yeah. Volatility will, or perceived volatility, will inevitably have an effect on cost uh, and opportunity to borrow. Uh, and without going into the, the details, if for, a, if, for example, you were exposed to the volatility of oil revenues in Scotland, the revenue borrowing requirement would consequently have to be much higher. Uh, do you see anything that we're doing in the current process as having the capacity to significantly change? The, borrowing, the revenue borrowing requirement that you would have to have in place? Well, certainly when we move from the Kalman Scottish rate of income tax proposals to the Smith Scottish rate of income tax proposals, then, then the risk is greater, um, mm. purely and simply because of the sums of money that are involved in the proportion of the budget that would be, um, that would be um, involved in this process. So, so yes, there is a... Um, a the, uh, the, the, um, there is a facility uh, there would be a necessity to look at that uh, uh, at that arrangement What borrowing mechanisms do you envisage achieving this? Well there's a, a, a you know, there'll be a, a, a variety of different um, um, models in place for us uh, for capital borrowing purposes um, you know, we have a number of options we could go to the Public Works Loan Board um, we could go to the markets, uh, we could undertake bonds, uh, a variety of different options that would be um, in place. Um, uh, but obviously, we'd have to make um, careful judgments about the, um, the terms and the conditions of, of any such borrowing. Mm. Although many of these variables are hard to assess at this stage, do you interpret that the Scottish Government would borrow, have have to pay a significantly higher interest rate to borrow than the UK government does? No. Um, why do you, given the, the potential additional volatility uh, that you'll be exposed to, uh, is there any circumstances which you could envisage where there may be a demand for a different uh, rate of interest from the Scottish government? I don't, because um, of, 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 of two things. Um, one is that all of this discussion um, has to take place within a, a, an acceptance, uh, reluctantly on, on, on my part, because Mr Johnson is familiar with my politics, uh, within the fiscal framework of the United Kingdom. So um, uh, that's, that, that, that's one element of the discussion. Uh, the second is, of course, that um, there is track record and performance. And th this administration in Scotland, uh, since 1999, um, of all political colours, um, has operated um, within an orderly financial regime. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that counts a great deal for the reliability that can be considered about the 
um, the, the, the handling of public finances by successive administrations. So, Alex, I think you've done pretty well here. <laughs> Pardon? I think you've done pretty well at this point. <laughs> do, you, do, you mind, do you mind if I just, I, I want to open a slightly different area on, on the borrowing issue. So, for, maybe you were going there anyway. Yeah. But, um, we, we, Calman 2012, Deputy First Minister, Calman 2012, Scotland Act, gave us the ceiling of 2.2 billion. We've had experts before us that said that should be nearer 5 billion. There's also other experts who said to us, actually, there should be no false limit put in place and it should be down to potential borrowing and affordability. What's your view? It, ultimately, I think these... Um, I think ultimately the, the, the most robust place to be is to have a, a, a prudential regime in place because it essentially reinforces the point I've just been making to Mr Johnson about financial stewardship, that it requires um, Parliament to consider all of the questions of affordability and sustainability. And um, we've already embarked on some of that in relation to our views around the financial framework that we have in place um, uh, about um, revenue financed investment. Um, and that's you know, we, have, we have a framework in place that indicates that um, we should only be borrowing, we should essentially be anchoring 5% of our total Dell budget in supporting revenue financed investment as a, essentially a, 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 a rule on sustainability. And I think that's the most robust and reliable mechanism that we can utilise. Okay. Um, Lewis, is that a supplementary? Just very briefly, uh, there's a lot of merit in, in a prudential borrowing arrangement. Does it have any impact, in your view, on the answer you gave a moment ago to Alex Johnson around the credibility of operating within the UK fiscal framework, protecting the level of interest rates at which the Scottish Government would be able to borrow? No, because the same strictures of um, financial performance will be required of the Scottish Government to participate in the uh, public finances of the United Kingdom. So, for example, you know, regardless of what ha you know, whatever happens with Smith, the finance minister and the Scottish government is still going to have to uh, deliver um, a budget that's that's um, that, 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 that's balanced and that is um, is consistent with all of the fiscal rules that are applied uh, to the finance minister that, that, that undertakes these responsibilities today and has done since 1999. Can I, can I just move on to? VAT, because I think we've got, we've got to get some stuff on the record on VAT, and then we'll move on to Crown Estate after that, if that's okay for me. Alec, are you okay if I do that? Yeah. Um, I just wonder what discussions have taken place between the Scottish and UK government in regard to proportion of VAT that will be, ass will be assigned and, and how that's going to be calculated, because we had some very interesting evidence from experts at an earlier session. So an understanding of that I think would be very useful to the committee. Well, I think there is there's, there's going to have to be um, a lot of technical and analytical work done to determine what should be the basis for the assignation of VAT. Um, I think, as with all these things, there is never one straightforward way of doing it. So there will be a multiplicity that we will have to work our way through. And again, the opportunity to um, define much of that uh, presents itself in the work that will be undertaken that the Chancellor and I have commissioned from civil servants over the course of the next uh, eight weeks or so. And that work that's been commissioned is also looking at how Scotland will retain any benefit from increased VAT take in Scotland. And, and is that part of that mix? Well, I think there's, uh, I think there's two separate issues in here, Convener. There is one which is um, establishing the analytical base for how VET should be apportioned. And then there's the policy question of guaranteeing that if, there is, if those estimates are exceeded, that Scotland retains the benefit of that improved economic performance and improved VET take as, 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 a, as a consequence. So um, those two separate issues... Um, have to be resolved as part of this exercise. But the policy question is uh, an inherent part of the fiscal framework that's got to be put in place. Okay. You indicated earlier you'd, you'd, you'd let us know a bit more about some of the progress that's been made on welfare and 
issues to do with the fiscal framework. Uh, uh, the, there's obviously a fair bit of work being commissioned. Could we, the committee, be provided with an outline also of what that work that's been commissioned looks like? I think it would be quite helpful to us so we know the sort of challenges that we face. Yeah, certainly, yeah. Convener. And I think if you go back to the question that Mr McNeill asked earlier on about the transparency of all this process, there is a, a very strong argument for that analytical work on the way in which VET could be assigned to Scotland is more widely understood yeah, and appreciated. Absolutely. And because there will be, um, well, there have been um, uh, individuals uh, with considerable expertise in this area who will have advised the committee in evidence. Um, it would be beneficial to see some of that um, material being considered um, more actively, because there will be, you know, these are. Th these, th these are parts of the process where there has to be an understanding about well, why is it done this way and why is it not done that way. So it's important that there is a, a wider public understanding and scrutiny of these questions. So I think that's actually a very good example of where we might be able to share material, subject again to the views of uh, the United Kingdom Government that would address the point that Mr McNeill raised earlier on. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. I think we'll move on to Crown Estate area now. We'll start with Tavish. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, I suppose the obvious first question, um, Mr. Swinney, would be: do, do your, Does your government believe that the clauses give effect to what the Smith Agreement um, said on uh, transferring the Crown Estate to Scotland and to the Scottish Parliament? And if not, dare I ask you, with a heavy heart, what discussions are ongoing to resolve any outstanding issues? I think it, it's. I think the best answer I could give is that I, I'm not sure on that point because we don't have we, we don't have quite the detail that's necessary to enable us to come to that conclusion. And um, I think the, uh, th this is an area where we do need to do more work to be absolutely satisfied that the intent that was in the Smith Commission process can actually be, is actually been uh, translated into uh, the proper legislative form. And is that one, therefore, that would be part of the ongoing official discussions that would then lead to ministerial discussions post-election? Does it, it fall into that yes, category? Yes, yeah. yeah. And um, have there been discussions, that, again, at official level between the Scottish uh, Crown Estate team, in other words, the team here in Edinburgh, um, just to look at some of these aspects? Yes, yes, that happened. Uh, and the other question I was going to ask here, um, you'll be familiar with that uh, in evidence last week, um, Angus Campbell, representing the three island authorities, made clear in terms of devolution within Scotland, in other words, to the islands, which, as you'll recall, is one of the clauses in Smith, um, that uh, the islands are looking to see both management of the, of the seabed and the revenues devolved. I very much understand your position on the revenues, but I wonder if you'd be so good as to set it out in terms of the management of the seabed as well. Well, I think we, we, that, that's one of the material issues that we need to understand better about what is envisaged within the, 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 the scheme that comes forward in this respect. Because, you know, on one particular issue, um, uh, you know, some of the issues that um, the UK government proposed to put into the, um, the, the, the scheme, I think would be better undertaken through a memorandum of understanding approach as opposed to by statute. So there's a, a, quite a bit of detail that we need to go through to satisfy ourselves that um, these issues can be properly addressed. That's fair. I just wonder, uh, if I may, Deputy First Minister, in the context of the seabed out to 12 miles, that's, the, as you're very familiar, that's the bit that the island authorities are particularly keen to, to as it, dare I say it, have control of in respect of both the management and the revenue functions. Is that, is that a reasonable proposition from the, your government's point of view? Well, certainly, you know, that, that's, the, that's the area of our active discussion with the island authorities on, on those points. And um, we're, we're very open to uh, pursuing that discussion with the island authorities. Um, we recognise very clearly their specific and special interest in this area. Um, and it's for that reason that um, Mr Mackay is um, working with the island authorities on, on these points. But we have to see that within the wider context of the, uh, the framework that's put in place. Thank you. And the last question I was going to ask, Convener, was I have to confess a bit of a surprise, I suspect, to Linda Fabian and I, which is the Crown Estate is going to continue, um, as we heard last week in evidence to this committee, to invest in Scotland. This is the, the, the continuing Crown Estate. Um, we, I mean, dare I ask what the, your government's perspective might be on that issue, which I must confess was a bit of a surprise to well, the rest of um, us. The, the, the Crown Estate continuing is a, is a, is a, is a very interesting concept. Not that, quite. Uh, I, I, 
I think this is where we, we get into the space where I think the spirit of the Smith Commission mm. is not being respected. Mm. Um, where I just think it's wholly... You know, we all know what we're talking about mm. here. This has been around for a long time, and lots of people have got long-standing commi long commitments in this area and thought they were being fulfilled by the Smith Commission. And then, hey, presto, one Thursday morning, the committee gets advised, well, actually, OK, we might have kind of devolved this bit to you, but we're still going to be here and um, continue our activities. And I just think it's disrespectful to the spirit of the Smith Commission and what it concluded. There may be an argument, and you would have a better view than I, that, that, that an investment vehicle bringing money into Scotland to invest in projects is a good thing. But that's, uh, that's different from devolving seabed, which is what we were predominantly ar arguing about, I guess. Yeah, I think that, that, that there are differences there, but I, I do think this gets into the territory yeah. where I think the... You know, that essentially... You know, we use the, the, the term... Um, Crown Estate continuing, it could be Crown Estate continuing and competing. Indeed. And I don't think that is in any way respectful of what the Smith Commission was putting in place. Thank you. Alison. Yeah, um, thank you, Convener. I'd just like to, to pursue that issue. I mean, any future property acquisition by the Crown Estate Commissioner would be owned by the Crown in a situation for where the responsibility for the administration and revenues of these property rights has since been devolved. Um, it, it just seems to me that that is a very difficult situation. Would it not make more sense that if the Crown Estate Commissioner carries on investing in Scotland, then he immediately passes over those assets for, for the management of and you know, responsibility for revenues of too, in order to try and stop the kind of competition that we're very concerned to learn about? I, I think the. I, yeah, I just sort of go back to what the, the, where the Smith Commission was in, was, was in this. I think you know, the Smith Commission was talking about the devolution of the Crown Estate mm -hmm. to Scotland and obviously a wider perspective within Scotland to our island communities. Um, I think if, 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 we'd, if the Smith Commission had, had been sitting around and had been added to the discussion, um, Oh yes, we'll, we'll, we'll devolve this, we'll, the Crown Estate, and then we'll allow the Crown Estate to continue in Scotland. I think people would have just their jaws would have hit the table. So I, I, I just think there's a I, I think there's a, a real danger that we have a well a we have a competitive environment here, which I think is undesirable and confusing. But more importantly, I think we've got a fundamentally disrespectful view been taken by the Crown Estate, uh, whereby in, 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 you know, in looking at an issue which has been long part of the political discussion and debate within Scotland, we get to this point of agreement where we think we've got the clarity and the opportunity to take it forward in terms of the Smith Commission proposals, notwithstanding what I've said about the, the clauses and the need to look at it in more detail. And, this, and the Crown Estate comes along and, and tries to thwart that agreement. And I just don't think, that's, I don't think that's the right way to proceed. Can I just be clear as someone who wasn't on the Smith Commission? When you were having those deliberations, everybody assumed that the Crown Estate was going to be devolved in its entirety. There wasn't a discussion like, at this date, you will have all these assets, and from then on, we will continue to build a large portfolio again. No. So this is quite a surprise. Oh, it's a su oh yes, it's a surprise. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and, if, and, and, and actually, and I come back to my point, because... If, if this had been put forward as a proposition around the table of the Smith Commission, I would have been very confident that the members of the Smith Commission would have said, we're having none of that. Mm -hmm. Because of the nature of the discussion that was going on about the Crown Estate within the Smith Commission. Mm -hmm. And given that's the case, are you hopeful that this can be resolved satisfactorily? I think, well, it's, the issue's only been aired and we'll now have to, it was aired last week, and we'll, we'll now have to pursue it. Okay. Um, can I just ask one further question, Convener, very briefly? One issue we touched upon last week was the fact that Fort Canaird, which is a, a large property in Lothian region, is not going to be devolved um, because of various legal and accounting reasons. 
And I just wondered if the government has, has a view on the fact that this very important economic asset won't be transferred. And potentially there could be similar cases in future if people find a way to, to prevent that from happening. I think, that would, uh, I think it's a, a very good example of uh, if that was to happen, if, the, if Fort Kinnear was not to be devolved, that, that would strike me as being just not in the spirit of what the Smith Commission has agreed. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Um, Rob. Um, in your discussions about Clause 23, um, I wonder if you've bottomed out the question of what the Scottish zone actually is. Um, and given that uh, definitions are usually attached to bills, is this an appropriate time to actually sort this out before uh, the bill is published and the definitions added? So that, for example, it includes what Andy Whiteman suggested in his evidence last week, ownership of the seabed, excluding hydrocarbons within Scotland's territorial seas out to 12 miles limits where this has uh, not been granted out, rights over the continental shelf to minerals excluding hydrocarbons and sedentary species from Scotland's territorial seas to 200 nautical mile limit, as laid out in the, uh, um, the statements in the uh, report on uh, land reform. Um, the my, my view on this um, is that the, the Smith Commission was very clear that um, the management of the Crown Estate's economic assets in Scotland um, should be transferred to the Scottish Parliament and that that should extend to 200 miles and cover the seabed. And, and forgive me if I've rehearsed this with the committee before, I think I might have done this um, when I perhaps was here before. But one of the reasons why the, I'm so absolutely certain and confident that the Smith Commission was envisaging out to 200 miles is because of the inclusion of Clause 34 in the Smith Agreement which covered um, concern that was being expressed within the Commission about um, the issues around a United Kingdom interests in relation to national critical infrastructure on defence and security, oil and gas and energy. So Clause 34 was drafted to address um, concerns that were expressed by some of my colleagues within the Crown Estate that some, within the context of going out to 200 miles, some critical UK interests had to be taken into account. And that's why Clause 34 is there. Um, so the context was, we go out to 200 miles and we make sure that the issues about which the UK has critical interests are covered by a memorandum of understanding. And that, that, that is what I think should be um, made explicit. And I think also, and my view on this is, is my, my response to Tavis Scott um, a moment ago was reflected on the fact that um, we, we don't know all of the detail here to enable us to be conclusive about it. I think it's really important that we have that detail absolutely crystal clear before Parliament d delivers its view on a legislative consent motion so that these things are beyond dispute after the passage of the Scotland Bill. So it should still be able to be discussed between now and the UK election, yes, even yes. after the PARDA period, so that the bill coming in uh, actually deals with that. Uh, given the draft clauses talk about the way in which uh, the Treasury may make a scheme transferring, um, we've uh, discussed this before about the fact that uh, Donald Dewar said that there shall be a Scottish Parliament. Do you think that uh, this uh, drafting is respectful of the conditions of uh, uh, devolving all of the Crown Estate assets in Scotland and Scottish Zone, etc. Uh, and uh, could uh, the argument be made that uh, it would be easier to get the scheme to work if it did say shall and therefore reaches some sort of timetable in which this can be done speedily? Because 
uh, stakeholders such as aquaculture people are terribly concerned about the length of time that it takes to actually get these uh, agreements put into place and the uncertainties therein. I think it would be better if um, two things happened. If the clause was to say the Treasury shall, a, or even kind of wills a bit firmer than shall even, um, and um, secondly, must. that we must ensure, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, under all circumstances, uh, perhaps. We could, but yeah, I, I, seriously, I think may is a word that's used in legislative terms to suggest discretion, uh, as opposed to obligation, which is what shall uh, is designed to say. Um, so I think that would clarify that point uh, uh, firmly. And then secondly, um, I think we need to interact uh, very closely about the scheme, because the scheme looks very complicated when, in fact, what was envisaged was the Crown Estate function would be devolved and the management of, of, of those assets would be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. But I, I just, in looking at the scheme, it looks to me to be just overly complicated for the realisation of the policy objectives that we all want to share. In that regard, then, uh, the subsection uh, 3 of 90B talks about uh, the exclusion of, the lim of uh, limited partnerships registered under the Limited Partnerships Act of 1907. Um, that probably refers to Fort Canaird, I suspect. But um, uh, is there any intention in the discussions before uh, the bill is uh, framed as to whether there can be any exceptions with regard to that in terms of Scottish property? Um, and indeed... You know, can I ask you, do you think that uh, it might be possible for the Crown Estate continuing to actually invest in the offshore area in competition with uh, the Crown Estate in Scotland? <coughs> um, I, I, I suppose that's technically feasible, yes. Uh, undesirable, but technically feasible. And, um, the, uh, and I come back to my point that you know, there's a clear policy intent here, and I think we've got to be careful with the wording of um, a section 23 that um, it is intensely complex and I think runs the risk of um, leaving circumstances in a fashion that um, we, we don't we, we find out a whole variety of exemptions and exceptions that we didn't think should be in there. Yeah. So the, the, these exemptions that have been placed in the uh, draft clauses were something which you would have found completely unacceptable had it been discussed at the time of Smith. Well, the Smith, the Smith, you know, Smith is, you know, is, is very clear. Re mm -hmm. Section 32 of Smith says responsibility for the management of the current state's economic assets in Scotland and the revenue generated from these assets will be transferred to the Scottish Parliament. No exceptions, no, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's issues um, about, um, you know, it goes on to define Crown Estates, seabed, urban assets, rural estates, mineral and fishing rights, and the Scottish foreshore for which it is responsible. It couldn't be clearer. Thank you. And I think the, to then put in exemptions and exceptions, I think, does not properly give due regard to um, the Smith Commission recommendations. Well, I'm sure it'll be interesting to see what the Secretary of State for Scotland has to say on these. Convener. Well, wait a couple of weeks. <laughs> Lewis. Yeah, I'm curious to pursue this question of, of the Crown Estate and the successor bodies because Mr Swinney has expressed his surprise in the way that other members of the Smith Commission have. Would, would it be fair to say that the expectation in wider Scotland was that the devolution of the Crown Estate's assets was focused primarily on the foreshore and seabed assets and rights uh, in the way that's been described. Um, 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 that perception may, uh, may be out there in Scotland, but I think the Smith Commission uh, clause was absolutely crystal clear. 32, this will include the Crown Estate's seabed, urban assets, rural estates, mineral and fishing rights, and the Scottish foreshore for which it is responsible. Yes, yeah, so it goes beyond the perception, but it's, it's, it's defined and it's defined as economic assets. Do you accept there's a distinction between those assets that you've described, that you've read from the list, and uh, investment portfolio acquisitions that may be acquired by any public commercial body 
uh, in any part of the UK? Um, well, we're not talking about any commercial operation. We're talking about the Crown Estate. Yes. So I think what Mr McDonald's trying to get me to, to get into is, you know, why on earth would I be concerned about a commercial operation in the UK investing somewhere in, in the United Kingdom and that may be in Scotland. Mm. Well, I have absolutely no objection to a commercial operation in the United Kingdom investing in Scotland. Absolutely no problem with that at all. What I have got a problem with is the Smith Commission coming up with a view that the economic assets of the Crown Estate should be devolved to Scotland and then finding ourselves with that objective being thwarted after all these years by the Crown Estate saying, well, actually, we'll keep, you know, we'll keep on doing what we do. And I just think that's disrespectful. But, but surely what the Crown Estate does that is the centre of public attention is manage the property of the Crown. The fact that it may operate in a commercial way, as, for example, Scottish Water might do in certain circumstances, is not, is not odd or unusual for a public corporation in, those, in, 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 uh, in the, uh, the tradition that we already have in the UK? It's, it's, it's not unusual, but then it's not every um, corporation that gets mentioned over um, four clauses in a, a landmark constitutional document signed by all five political parties in Scotland that says that these functions should be devolved to the Scottish Parliament. I think that's, that's not every other public corporation or investment vehicle gets mentioned in that fashion. And for, for that to be defined and then for the Crown Estate to say, well, actually, we're going to kind of go over the top of that, I just think is, is well, I think it's disrespectful. So what, what, what is your proposition? And would you propose to say that the Crown Estate would be specifically the only public commercial body that could not invest in Scotland? Well, I think we're, I think we're just getting into... Oh. You know, I, th I think all I mean, of if there I'm is a problem, what's I'm your solution? What, 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 what I'm simply saying is that what the Smith Commission suggested should be respected. That's all I'm saying. Everybody's, that's, that's my entire line of argument through my time with the committee this morning, is the Smith Commission report should be respected. And I think this is a classic example where it has not been respected. Clearly, the assets that the Crown Estate transfers to a successor body in Scotland become then the assets, the property on which the Scottish successor body operates. Would you regard it as unusual if that successor body chose to make investments other than in those assets in order to make a return for those assets? Uh, no, because, that's the, because that would be the legitimate function of the devolved Crown Estate. And would you think it would be legitimate for that devolved Crown Estate to make business investments to support its central core elsewhere in the UK? I don't think that would be... Uh, I don't think that would be a legitimate uh, proposition to be taken forward by the Crown Estate in Scotland. But in, unless you make a legal adjustment, that would be a policy decision, whether it was by the Scottish successor body or the UK Well, that's why body. we've got to get the detail of all of this correct as to what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. Um, and if, um, you know, if, if, if we're going to say that the Scottish Crown Estate is not going to invest in England, then we should say to the rest of the, the Crown Estate continuing, then we should allow the Crown Estate in Scotland to get on with its business and not compete with another Crown Estate. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, I, I, I guess I'm looking at your remit as a finance minister and wondering why you regard investment by the Crown Estate in Scotland as competitive rather than supportive. Why would external investment not always be welcome? Um, I'm, I'm simply saying that I think the Crown, look, the first thing I want to say, and I want to reiterate this point, because I don't want Mr Macdonald to go away creating um, um, mis, um, misconceptions here. I, I welcome investment in Scotland. I regularly get criticised for some of the investments that I bring forward into Scotland, but I welcome it nonetheless. What I think is the Crown Estate is not any old investor. The Crown Estate is... Um, a significant body within the structure of the United Kingdom, which the Smith Commission has judged it appropriate to say should be subject to the management uh, of the um, uh, the management of the economic assets and the revenue generated from these assets should be um, within the province of the Scottish Parliament. And I simply think that should be respected 
uh, as part of the, uh, the the design of the scheme here. Yeah, okay, because uh, Stuart has a question on this, and I've got to cover some of the constitutional intergovernmental relations stuff, although we've had a fair bit of intergovernmental relations discussion already. Stuart, have you got any uh, question yeah, in this yes, area? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, in terms of the, the Crown Estate, uh, sections 32 and 33 of the Smith Commission were very clear in terms of what uh, was, uh, was, was being looked for. And the, after what we heard last week, it kind of struck me that uh, if there were to be two Crown Estates effectively in operation in Scotland, uh, and after uh, the Crown Estate in Scotland is further devolved to local authorities, uh, to the islands, as per section 33, um, it struck me that actually that this could be uh, overly bureaucratic. Uh, it could actually, it will be uh, certainly uh, a bit more uh, complex, uh, as you've already indicated earlier. But also, it struck me that in terms of local authorities, they could actually have a, an additional cost burden if they're having to try to deal with two different Crown Estates when it comes to uh, potential investment. Now, I don't know if you think that's, a, uh, that, that's a, an argument uh, that uh, certainly could be deployed uh, against. Uh, to Crown Estates? I, I, th I, think the, I think it's less of an issue in, 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 in this sphere. Um, uh, but although, although I suppose the, re the recipe for confusion uh, opens up if the Crown Estate starts to become involved in areas that um, are, are under the responsibility of the Scottish Parliament in which we um, agree to, um, to devolve to local authorities. So I, I suspect there is there's, there's certainly an opportunity for confusion. Um, whether there's an opportunity for more bureaucracy um, is, is a different question. Okay. We'll move on to the area of constitutional area, for want of a better description, and intergovernment relations, although we've had a fair bit of discussion about that already. What's the Deputy First Minister's take on the clauses as they're drawn up on Sewell and permanency? On the issue of um, permanency, um, I would say that I think a, there are particular words that are used in the clause which um, are a bit unrecon uh, are a bit un well, I just don't know if I, I'm not sure if they need to be there. It's the words recognised as um, I think they just um, I don't know quite what the purpose of adding those words in, and I think it would be clearer if those words were not. Um, uh, were not in the uh, the first clause. Um, so, um, in section one, uh, subsection two, part one a, it says a, um, sorry, it's not. It's one a. A Scottish government, a Scottish Parliament, is recognised as a permanent part of the United Kingdom's constitutional arrangements. I think it would just be. Sort of blunter if it was a Scottish Parliament is a permanent part of the United Kingdom's constitutional arrangements. Now, we all know that the, the limitations of this type of arrangement, so given our knowledge of what are the limitations of this type of arrangement, I think it would be better if we just sort of stated it as boldly as we possibly could do. I think everyone recognises that in terms of the legal standing of this, it's as only as good as the next UK government. I think everyone accepts that. But I guess the purpose of this being in the Smith proposals and being in the clauses is to give a political assurance, effectively, that the Scottish Parliament is, is as embedded and as permanent as can be achieved. Was that the intent behind Smith? And yes, yeah. that's right. Well, yeah, the, 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 I think people were, people were, um, were very clear around the table of the Smith yeah, sure. uh, Commission um, I, and I, I stress, I, I should possibly have said at the outset, convener, you know, I was a member of the Smith Commission and I'm here giving evidence, but, you know, obviously other members of the Smith Commission may have a different view of some of the things that were transacted. So I, I, I simply, uh, you know, expressing a view on behalf of the Scottish Government, I obviously dwell on my experience as a member of the Smith Commission, um, as were others. But um, I, I think it was everybody sort of walked, sort of agreed to this clause on the, the, the clear understanding that um, there was no, you know, in the absence of a written constitution, there was no stronger um, assurance than this type of mechanism. And I just think it would be clearer if it just, if the words recognised as weren't there. Um, so that's, that's one of the points that we've raised. On the, um, 
the Sewell, con the Sewell Convention, uh, the draft clause puts the Sewell Convention as a convention into statute, uh, rather than putting the convention on a statutory footing. Um, so there's a, a, an issue there that I think we need to explore with the UK Government. On Sewell, as you, as you know, I've, Sewell seems to have run in my blood for a fair bit of time when I was a minister. And from my perspective, the Sewell Convention seemed to work reasonably well. Yes, there were occasions when there were challenges, but that allowed for a bit of discussion, a bit of movement. Do you think there's a, any danger in having Sewell made in a permanent way as in statute that it might reduce flexibility, room for movement, and finding a way forward? Mm -hmm. I think we've got to be... I think we've got to take care to ensure that um, there is always the room for a flexibility and negotiation. Um, so I, I, I think we, we've got to, as, as we embark on, the, on this issue, just take care to ensure that um, we are not unnecessarily restrictive in what we put in place to, um, to, con to, to, to define these arrangements. Thank you. Has anybody else got any other questions? Lewis. Just very quickly. If you could expand just a little on your distinction between putting Sewell on a statutory footing and putting Sewell into statute, what's your concern there? I suppose well, it's the, what the issue is about is whether the substance, the process, is put into statute to give us um, confidence around the, 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 the substance of Sewell as opposed to there shall be a Sewell convention which will be in, in statute. And that gets to the convener's point about whether if you put more of the substance into statute, does that restrict flexibility to negotiate around some of these questions? And, and all I'm saying is if we put it further into, if we put the substance into statute, we have to do that in a fashion that respects the point that the convener has made about the necessity for flexibility. So do you regard it as adequate as it currently stands? You sound quite open-minded about it. But. No, I think, I, I, think it could, I, I think we would benefit from putting <coughs> the Sewell Convention into statute, but in the fashion that the convener set out in his question. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. It's on the IGR. Yeah. Uh, today we've heard uh, issues regarding the Intergovernmental Assurance Board, the GMC and the, the Joint Exchequer uh, Committee. Uh, are there, uh, in terms of these uh, examples, uh, are there any other examples um, that, uh, that you could uh, tell the committee about in terms of the intergovernmental relations that take place, but also are there any, uh, any lessons that we can learn uh, from the experience of the Joint Exchequer Committee? Um, there are, I suppose, in, in, there are a number of mechanisms that uh, exist just now. There's the Joint Ministerial Committee, there's the Joint Exchequer Committee, there's the Finance Minister's Quadrilateral, which is the Finance Ministers of each of the uh, United Kingdom administrations, um, or the administrations within the United Kingdom, that meet to discuss relevant issues. There's the Joint Ministerial Committee, well, Joint Ministerial Committee, domestic and European, um, and there will be the now as part of these arrangements, there will be the welfare reform um, or the welfare devolution uh, working groups. So I think that's prob and then in addition to that, there will be a variety of other uh, intergovernmental interactions that will take place in addition to, to these questions. Um, do you think that, uh, that these uh, various examples that you provide, do you think that they are uh, adequate? Do you think that uh, they are suitable or, or should, they, uh, should they be uh, increased or, uh, or improved upon? I certainly think they should be improved upon. Um, you know, one of my frustrations with the, um, the, the Finance Minister's quadrilateral, one of my frustrations with the Joint Exchequer Committee is that uh, ultimately, we, um, if we don't like what happens, the, you know, the, 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 the Treasury view tends to prevail. And I don't think that enables there to be a, the uh, obtaining of an outcome 
that is satisfactory to the Scottish interest in all circumstances. So I think one of the, uh, the, the, the issues that I think has to be explored is how we can make the, this type of intergovernmental machinery more meaningful as part of the process, how we can enable discussions to take place in a fashion that lead to devolved administrations feeling um, as if they've made, perhaps made some progress as opposed to being thwarted by um, a, a final view being taken by the Treasury um, or the UK Government. And certainly, Mr. Stewart, I'm to, there's a specific in there I think Duncan would like to deal with a separate <coughs> supplementary. You've, you've, we've almost got an audit of all of these you know, points of contact, but it was interesting to hear you mention the, uh, the necessity um, to improve the machinery as it currently stands, and, and, and I'm sure many of us would support you in that. Um, we read from our, uh, some of our papers, uh, for one of them in particular was that um, the, 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 um, the information for government um, a paper that said that work is already underway to reform the UK's intergovernmental machinery, and a working group has been established um, to revise principles and structures of that machinery. And the first meeting was February 2015. Now, are the Scottish Government participating in that working group? Uh, are they there alone? Are, are, are there uh, representatives from the, the Welsh and Northern Ireland groups there? Uh, and what positions do you take into that working group in regards to what principles need to be established and what reform needs to take place? And if that could be shared with the committee, I think that would also be useful for us. So on, on that um, exercise, the Scottish Government is participating, as are the other um, devolved administrations. Uh, the, the, the meeting in February, in fact, was chaired by a member of the Scottish Government, a, a civil servant of the Scottish Government. These discussions have all happened at official level um, and subject to the necessary checking of um, comfort from other administrations about sharing of information. We'll happily share uh, what information we can with the committee. In terms of Mr McNeill's point about what do we take into those committees, I think that, that really is this... First Minister, I'm, I'm just, we're running out of time. I want to do a bit of inequality. Could you just... Could you write to us on what you take into it? I don't want to curtail the discussion, but mm -hmm. I've just got a bit of time issues here. And I know it's Stuart McMillan hadn't finished, and then I'm going to Alice and I'm going to need to get something on the record on equality issues. Mm -hmm. uh, on your evidence, uh, Deputy First Minister, you, you gave the example of the, of the budget processes that the two uh, parliaments have and, and how they differ. Um, uh, obviously, post the Smith uh, being implemented and devolution post Smith, um, how do you see the parliamentary process as actually having an effect upon the intergovernmental workings? I, 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 well, I, I think basically that governments have to relate to the requirements of their parliaments. Um, so if parliament wants, to, you know, I'm a servant of parliament and the public, if parliament wants to design how it wants to interact with ministers, that's parliament's business and, and I should respect it. Um, but, and, and if, you know, and I'm not altogether sure I, you know, one of my points in answer to some of my questions today has been that whilst I might wish to be open with Parliament here about particular issues on evidence and all the rest of it, I would have to, out of respect, say to the UK Government, are you comfortable with this? Because it's the, only, it's the proper, way, proper way to act. Um, but that's, you know, so the parliamentary culture here might be more open than the parliamentary culture and, or the parliamentary requirements in the House of Commons. Um, but, you know, I would have to, the only bit of intergovernmental activity I'd have to be mindful of is whether the UK government was comfortable with me responding positively to the requirements of Parliament. I need to go to Alison now on equality issues to get some of this stuff on the record. Um, thank you, convener. The the Smith Commission report stated that the Scottish Parliament would have all powers in relation to elections to the Scottish Parliament. However, there's no mention of gender quotas for the Scottish Parliament. So do you agree that it is the case that the Parliament doesn't really have all the powers in relation to elections? And just a final question, if I may. Does the government consider that the drafting of Clause 24 is sufficient to allow the Scottish Parliament to legislate to impose gender quotas on public bodies as a starting point? I think on Alison Johnson's final point, um, 
the, the, the command paper says that that should be the case, but our reading of the clause is that it's far from clear that that is actually the provision there. So mm -hmm. it, may, it may be drafting an interpretation, but we certainly would want to have that ability to act in that fashion, but we're not confident the legislation in front of us enables us to do so. On the first part of the question about um, a, elections, um, I, I think we, we certainly would want to engage constructively to ensure that um, that point was properly addressed. That would certainly be my, you know, my objective would be to ensure that that was the case. Um, and if we had, con if there were concerns about the provisions that are in place, then I would want to make sure they were properly acted upon. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Deputy First Minister. I think we've come to the end of the session. I've got to be very careful of the clock here, and I know you have to think about questions, etc., which are coming up soon. Uh, th there's obviously a number of areas where we still haven't managed to complete all of our discussions, so we may write to you just to, to follow through with some further questions, um, and you've already given us a commitment to follow up and write in a number of areas already, so we're very grateful. Uh, so to you and your officials, thank you for being here today, and we now move on to private session. Thank you very much.